Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you. I just took my spectacles off. And now I realize I don't really see very much. So I put them back on. Nice to see you. Yeah. All right, friends. Another day, another Dharma. Chance to sit together. Um, yesterday, morning after the full moon, July, no, the July full moon of Guru Purnima, I just spoke a little about that sense, the moment of the year in the Indian traditions where remembers, honors, uh, appreciates one's teachers. I spoke a little bit about uh, my relationship to my teachers in that way. And I thought I might consider continuing a slightly similar theme today. Just so one of my teachers was here the last two weeks, long for Suchito, Ajahn Suchito. And somebody who's been a forest monk for 47 years. And one of the things that's very interesting, you know, sort of the, the lives of forest monastics are very, very, very constrained. Right? There's the 227 uh, training precepts, you know, 227 things they're not allowed to do, basically. And just in contrast to a lot of other Buddhist traditions that have updated and changed the rules in all kinds of ways. The forest monks really try to, well, they not try, they just keep the same rules as have been there since the time of the Buddha. And of course, some of those are very uh, out of date, inconvenient, I might say incompatible even with uh, contemporary European life. And so it's very interesting right, how one relates to those things. And just being with uh, Long Po for uh, these two weeks, seeing those constraints, right? There, is, there isn't a single hour of his day, waking life, that isn't constrained in some or other way by things that just, you know, the activities that can't be done, uh, movements that can't be made, situations that can't be entered into, etc. So, so it sounds a bit scratchy. You know what? That's probably the way my mic is. Uh, let, me, let me clip my mic on different. Now it probably sounds worse than ever. How about that? Better? Um, so there isn't a single hour of his life, of his waking life, that isn't constrained in all these kinds of ways. And what's interesting is to see him completely committed, just completely committed, 47 years in robes, completely committed to just a kind of surrender to all those constraints, right? to feeling for and knowing and living a sense of ease and freeness within so many constraints. So often we have the idea, I need to get rid of constraints in order to feel free. And so that's on the one hand, just that sense of, I oh, just surrender. It doesn't matter whether the rules make sense, whether that I'd like the rules, whether they're convenient, whether they're out of date. Yeah, yeah, all that. It's like, do I want to get hung up on being right, being comfortable, or being free? So that's the one thing, just that sense of, on the one hand, complete surrender to the, the rules, the vinaya, the training discipline. And on the other hand, just kind of ease, freeness around it. Um, so a completely commitment to that. And yet, at the same time, actually just holding the whole thing, some of the arcane Buddhist stuff, some of the bits that have been codified and ossified over time 
and that aren't really to do with the Buddha Sasana, right? The dispensation, the actual teachings and the practice invitations of Buddha, but are more to do with just the way things have gotten religious, religi, religiosified over time. And then the capacity to really be discerning about that and to recognize, oh, this, this bit's a bit ridiculous. This is some leftover rule. And just, there's a lot of paradox, a lot of contradictions within all that. And just the sitting in the contradictions very lightly, very easily, very peacefully. So within that, I think there's an invitation for all of us in our practice, right? an invitation to have that sense of, you know, if this is, well, maybe an important area of our life, maybe the very center for me, you know, since I was 19, since I first encountered Dharma practice, it's really been the central feature, the, the central commitment, the central orientation of the whole of the rest of my life. It's the way I, it's the lens through which I look at everything. It's the, um, it's the framework through which I make sense of everything. It's the mirror in which I keep seeing myself. And it's the, it's the way in which I uh, orientate to recognizing any friction I'm creating and to dropping it. It's therefore a container in which the taste of freeness really comes alive. And so the invitation, I think, is to have that kind of centrality, like let this, which is the, the, my orientation to whether I'm free or not in any given moment. And the Dharma, that is the invitation to freeness constantly and the mirror to friction whenever that's, whenever I'm doing that. On the one hand, to let that be like the central feature. Whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing, to, to engage with it through a Dharma lens, to see it through a Dharma lens, to recognize what's happening through a Dharma lens. Everything, every moment, every situation, every experience, every mind state, every relationship. And while holding that steady, because that's the, that's the way to potentize one's practice. Like Ajahn Chah says, let go a little, you'll have a little peace. Let go a lot, you'll have a lot of peace. Let go completely, and you'll have complete peace and free now, freedom here and now. The, 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 the way in which we commit our lives, really, to practices and teachings and these frameworks is directly the degree to which we taste the fruits of that commitment. So as I say, on the one hand, that invitation, right, commit, let go, dive in, open up, meet everything as if every moment is a doorway, a Dharma doorway, as if every moment is sacred, as if every moment is an opportunity as if every moment is the invitation to know the freeness of our true nature because every moment is that and meanwhile on the other hand just to hold it all lightly loosely, to not take oneself, to not take one's practice so personally, to not hold it so preciously. You know? Let it be precious, but don't hold it tightly. Well, who was it? Well, maybe Oscar Wilde, it sounds like something he would have said. It's that line about, you know, life is too grave a matter to be taken so seriously. All right, so those are the reflections of the morning. Mm -hmm. Commit completely, hold it lightly. Let's sit together in meditation.
let your attention gather and settle. No forcing. Rather just recognizing that you're here. That your consciousness is illuminated by life. the scratchy sound. Mm. I wonder if Hmm, how's that? Hmm. Worse. Worse. Worse, really. Right. I'm just gonna say a few words and I'm gonna turn the sound down. Just let you sit, we just sit together. I'm not try taking that out. I don't know if that'll help. Check the settings. Just recognizing the way. Awareness is not a product of you doing anything. And you're already here. Already awake. This awakeness, on the one hand, it's oh, simple, natural, here. It's the very way in which you're, the way in which your experience is lit up. Okay, good to know the sound has improved. Yeah, good. I'm not quite sure what I did, but hey, oh, I'll take it. And then the way in which the natural, the most natural expression of this awakeness is for it to settle. Right. Most essentially, your attention doesn't want to be all spaced out and fragmented. And neither does it want to be forced anywhere. It wants to just settle here. So let your attention settle into the feel of being here. As if all your attention, as if awareness itself is dissolving into and lighting up your cells. So that when you feel the expansion of the in-breath, that feel of the breath is illuminated by awareness. And when you feel the relaxation of the out-breath, that relaxing feel It's quite effortlessly known by awareness. Breathing in awareness. Awareness 
in the breath. Sitting in awareness. Awareness in the sitting. Settling like this then into meditation. Just that, just allowing awareness to settle into experience. Again and again, if necessary, as you come back from whatever thought stream might pull at your attention. Giving yourself the opportunity to taste that sense of harmonizing awareness and experience. With 
being at rest where you are, of having body and mind and world be a single field. a naturally unfolding field, a freely displaying field. This is what it means to enter into presence. Don't let the sounds be a distraction. There's no such thing as real distraction. Sounds are not a distraction, they're just sounds. Sounds happen like breath happens, like thoughts happen, like sensations happen. And they just flicker in awareness. And just another invitation to let your awareness both enter into what's happening and expand around what's happening. So the squirrels on the roof that you could hear. Sounds of water outside. Birdsong, 
truck noise. Cat meow. My voice. Sounds of street or neighbors or nature where you are. Just let it in. Let it pass through. Don't make up the idea of distraction. the whole of meditation is the infinite ongoing refinement of settling into being here of harmonizing awareness and experience of allowing everything to unfold freely.
of dissolving friction and resistance. Of it, of tasting an essential and inconceivable freeness. of being naturally, effortlessly awake. If you feel a little restless or agitated, keep letting your attention drop down, dissolving the busyness of the head center down into the heart center, down into the belly center. down into the basic deep aliveness that's sitting here.
down into the earth. The feel of awareness extends in all directions, down and up, inwards and outwards. A field of awareness permeates all of space, all of experience. But at first we often need to go down. Down into the field of sitting here. Down into a sense of relaxation. Of softening. Down into a, your belly. All the way down. All the way down. Staying, settling, softening into being here.
May we be at ease where we are. When may we see the invitation of each moment? Or may we dare to fall in? See a little bit of uh, Priya in the morning. Say hello, Priya. <laughs> hmm. All right, friends. Nice to have some meditation time together. There's a little extra time for questions, if you have them. I see Maddie has already asked one. So if you if you have a question or anything you'd like to explore, please just do like Maddie and write question ahead of whatever you write. <sighs> yeah, and then just to mention Dana, just that brief mention every day, all this is freely offered. There's a lot of work, a lot of people's commitment and skill and time and work and energy goes into making all of this possible. So it's completely freely offered, right? It's free to be here. It's free of any commitment. It's free of any charge. But it's not free of costs. You know, there's many, many costs. There's thousands of dollars of overheads every month to, just to keep this show on the road, if you like, to keep the lights on here. So, um, and the only way that's maintained is through dana. And that's that principle running through Sangha Live of kind of that sense of dana being mutual support, mutual exchange, mutual appreciation. So we try to support you the best we can. And we ask you, please support us the best you can. And whether you're able to offer you know, whatever amount that might be, whether it's an, more or whether it seems to you to be very little, please just to connect, oops, to connect with the goodness of the offering in the moment of offering. So thank you. And if you feel like you really can't afford to offer anything, that's fine. You know, that's the way Dana works. If you can't afford to offer anything, it's fine. Just take in the goodness, take it as a, an offering, a blessing, you know. And if you can afford to, to offer something, please do. Yeah, if you want, I mean, if you want to support what's happening here, it's a support for me, it's a support for Sangha Live, it's a support for everybody else that um, can then come and practice here. All right. Maddie says, What are you connecting to? if you let everything pass through. Good. Most essentially, I wouldn't quite put it in the language of connecting to, but rather recognizing your nature as that which is not everything. Everything comes and goes. Everything passes through. What doesn't pass? What doesn't move? What doesn't change? Everything moves. Everything changes. Everything passes. What is it passing through? What is it passing through? What is, the, what is knowing the passing of everything? What is this alive, conscious space in which everything appears and disappears? What is that which we call consciousness or awareness or me or reality? What is this space? Right. And of course, we don't find any good answers when we ask ourselves that question. Right. And yet, by keeping a 
noticing the way everything changes, everything flows, everything moves, everything streams through awareness, we, we begin to infer, maybe glimpse, and more and more actually recognize our true home as this space in which, this space through which everything passes. So it's not so much that we're connecting to that space because that would suggest a somebody doing the connecting and a something being connected to. And it doesn't work because some bodies come and go. Some things come and go. So the somebody that's trying to connect isn't reliable and the something that's trying to be connected to isn't reliable. So we're not connecting to that in some way. We're, As I say, we're recognizing the very nature of um, the very nature of the aliveness of everything right? as our home, a home in which everything is known and it's coming and going, and, in, and yet which itself doesn't come and go. So if that makes if any of that makes sense to you, just follow that thread. If it doesn't make sense to you, don't worry for now. Right? Just going to keep the sense of settling. Settling, if you want to know, well, what am I settling into? Just settling into presence. Settling into the feel of being here, even though that feel is punctuated by changing experience. The feel of being here is characterized mostly by changing sensations, changing sounds, changing thoughts, etc. That's okay. Just keep settling. Settling, settling, just keep settling amidst all of that changing uh, flow of experience and see what happens. All right. Lots of appreciation for Priya. Raki obviously knows that Priya means beloved or favorite. Yes. Uh, Ruth says, I've just returned from a couple of weeks walking on the Camino in France. It was hard to leave the beauty and camaraderie of the path, of the chemin, of the path. This meditation was helpful to bring awareness to this transition. Good. Good. Yeah. Then Rivka says, could you illustrate a daily life of the one who surrenders all? <laughs> What so what what first of all, Rivka, I would ask, what do you think your daily life would look like or feel like if you were to surrender all? What do you think it would look like or feel like? You often we have the sense of what we think it would look like or feel like is oh is some sort of deprivation. Oh I've surrendered everything, I've surrendered fun, <laughs> I've surrendered sort of enjoying food. We think that surrender involves surrendering pleasures. I would say it involves more. It involves surrendering resistance. And most essentially, it involves surrendering the, t the tendency to constantly take ourselves as being separate from the rest of life. That's what we're really surrendering. And it's not, we don't, it's not that we surrender all, as if it's a big grand gesture. It's more that we surrender just again. We just, what do we actually surrender? Not all. We surrender this. This, this moment of realizing I'm, uh, uh, I'm pushing, I soften. Surrender this moment of going, uh, realizing I'm going faster than I need to. Oh, I'm softening. And that, mo and that each moment of surrender then becomes a taste of freeness. So to illustrate the daily life of one who surrenders all, it has the taste of freeness running through it. So, but but don't have the idea of surrendering all because it seems too kind of big or too far away or something. Just surrendering this, just this. Yeah, and that's what meditation is, right? It's a constant invitation in a, a rather subtle way. Oh, to what I was calling settling, slowing, softening. Yeah. And so the more we can integrate that, not just in meditation, which is the sort of very subtle version of that, but then when you go into the kitchen, 
you know, when you're making tea and you realize that you're just, you, you're generating impatience. Oh, and then soften and get, the, get, get a feel for the taste of those small moments of surrender. Okay. Job asks, is there a source available on how to chant the melody and lyrics of the Guru Stotram like you did yesterday? You know, I don't know if there is. I looked up yesterday on Spotify. I looked up Guru Stotram. I found all kinds of different um, versions of it, but I didn't find the version that I was um, chanting. So uh, the, the, the ly lyrics you can find, probably. There's various different versions. So I'm not sure. Let, let me have a look. Maybe I can write the lyrics to the version I chanted yesterday. And then you can always uh, just learn the melody from the recording that's there. So most of the Guru Stotrams always start with Om Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwara. Om Guru Sakshat Param Brahma Tasmai Sri Guru Venama. And then they go on in a different way. And the one I like is uh, goes on. Um, Dhyan Mulam Guru Murti. Dhyan means meditation. Dhyan Mulam, uh, the practice of meditation, Guru Murti. Murti means a statue. So it's like, uh, it's what that line is, is saying your teacher, uh, the, the, the image of your teacher, that's meditation. Jan Mulam Guru Murti, Puja Mulam Guru Padam. Um, your, your, the, the, your teacher's feet are the place where puja, real puja, worship happens. Jan mulam guru murti puja mulam guru padam mantra mulam guru bakyam. The speech bakyam. The speech of your teacher is the pure mantra. Mokshe mulam guru kripa, and the blessing of your teacher is where liberation comes from. So it has this just very kind of devotional feel running through it. Yes. Um, and a friend was here, I think, Duncan, I don't know if you're here this morning, Duncan, but a, a Duncan was here uh, a couple of weeks ago recording um, with me for a week for a course I'm doing for Tricycle. And we did some sound recording as part of that. So I will put up the recordings of different chants on my website, but it, it'll be a week or two from now. I'll let you know. I'll try to let you know when it happens. Um, but first, those have to be edited, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right? But there will be some kind of uh, audio file of uh, greatest hits of, of my kind of grumbly old raspy chanting stuff. All right, let's stop there. Thank you for your kind attention. I'm happy to share some practice with you. I send you greetings from me and. My cat, who's, look at that, very, very uh, good sitter. You're a good sitter. <laughs> Take care, friends. See you tomorrow.